Welcome to the e-commerce toolbox, Expert Perspectives, a podcast by Noibu, where we explore the elite strategies and cutting edge insights with our expert guests. Get ready to propel your e-commerce business to the next level. Welcome everyone to another episode of the e-commerce toolbox, Experts Perspective. Joining us today, we have Luis, who heads up the e-commerce operations team in Europe for Specialized Bicycles. So really, really excited to have you on the episode today. Welcome, Luis. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Awesome. I always like to start off by understanding a bit of everyone's background. So obviously, you have a diverse background. I saw that you worked in marketing, you were a founder. Now you're heading up a very important department at a really, really historic bicycle company. So curious to learn a bit more in your own words, how you got there and what the role entails today. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite funny because my career started actually in finance. I started working in the stock market and eventually that led me to get an internship in Poland where I got to learn a little bit of marketing back then when gold hacking was a thing. So I took a lot of courses, honestly. I wanted to get an additional income, so I got into growth hacking myself, some development, some marketing myself, and then got into advertising, digital marketing, and you know, as you said, managing advertising spend for industrial companies for Latam, and eventually that led me into e-commerce. Uh, finally, I started playing with WordPress, Shopify, Magento myself, started making some websites on my own and for customers. And of course, yeah, eventually got into integrating, you know, the e-commerce into the advertising engines and then to chatbots and then to other platforms. So got to understand how they work on a small scale, right? And yeah, I got my like big opportunity in Donaldson a few years ago, launching e-commerce in Peru, selling industrial parts for the transportation industry. Luckily, in a way, and it seems like destiny, perhaps, but Specialized also had the same structure, like same CRM, same ERP, same content management platform. So it felt like it logical to do this jump, right? So I started as an e-commerce coordinator myself, then e-commerce manager, then got into marketplaces a few years after, also getting into Amazon, Mercado Libre in Latam for Specialized specifically, then a couple of projects for Specialized Global. And finally, fortunately, some good results led me to this opportunity, getting into this point, now leading e-commerce operations for Europe and Specialized, which I'm pretty much in charge of everything after a customer is trying to pay, you know, like financial options, payment methods, logistics operations, packaging, customer service, all these kind of things that are not very pretty, I would say, but they are absolutely necessary for e-commerce. Really, really cool background. And a lot of things I've heard as you're chatting is you mentioned Poland, which is obviously in Europe. Then you mentioned like Latin America and and Mexico and and Peru. So maybe curious, having worked in both markets in e-commerce, what are some of the key differences between kind of the European e-commerce market and the Latin American e-com market? There are plenty. I think the first one is geographically. Every Latin market has like their own logistic system. They have vast territories, like they're huge. So you have a lot of places to cover. Like, I don't know, Mexico, for example, is quite flat, but you have sea, you have mountains, you have a lot of things. So you have to do everything you can to deliver the product everywhere you can. Colombia has a lot of hills, for example. Chile is more like focused in the capital in terms of uh, consume and purchasing habits. Europe is just one huge country to say it in a way, right? So you can see a lot of differences in the logistic layout that they have. But usually they have one warehouse or two warehouses across the continent. So it's easier to deliver within Europe. And of course, open borders makes everything easier. Talking about, for example, from a marketing perspective, GDPR regulations are a huge thing in Europe. Like sharing information is a big problem for marketing individuals. Usually you see like 45, 50%, 55% of consent in terms of GDPR. So you don't have a lot of information from users, something that doesn't happen in LATAM. So you have plenty of information from users. So there's a lot of material to work with. What else? Pricing regulations and competition. It depends on what you're selling, of course. 
but it, there's more competition, I think, in Europe in terms of pricing. And since they are not regulated, it's hard to, I mean, from the owner perspective, to always have the best pricing because it depends if you have distributions or you are actually selling other individuals to sell your products. It makes it hard. You can see a lot of different prices for just one product in Europe. And that doesn't happen very often in LATAM. You can own the price and you can own, you know, the expectation of your product a little bit easier in LATAM. Payment methods, for example, credit, it's a huge thing in LATAM and in the US also. So you always see installments, you always see something like that, which makes it easier, especially to sell higher ticket products in LATAM. In Europe, it's not the same thing. It's very hard to see credit cards with huge limits. Is more common to see debit payments or local acquiring, for example. You also see a lot of wallets like PayPal, Apple Wallet, Google Pay, things like that. And it depends on the country. Even though they are very close to each other, you see a lot of differences in terms of processing. Like there are local partners or banks that are very relevant. So you have to kind of make agreements in every country you are operating with. So that's a kind of difficult. And in terms of purchasing habits, for example, I would say that it's more common that you buy something in that time if you need it, then you use it. And if you don't want it, then you return it. And in Europe, I've seen this quite often. Like they buy a lot of things online. They just keep what they want and they return what's left, right? So there are huge returns rates in Europe, especially for apparel or sports industry. You see these returns rates usually up in the sky. So they are huge Makes sense. And obviously that creates a ton of work for you folks on the post-purchase side. One thing that you'd mentioned was data collection from GDPR. Curious, so has the amount of people shopping online as a whole kind of since the pandemic and leading into the pandemic really enabled the teams that you're working with to make better data-driven decisions, given that the sheer amount of shoppers and volumes and interactions have just gone nowhere but up? over the last four or five years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say not only the pandemic, but also like the adoption of mobile shopping. Um, mobile shopping has also enabled us to get information from social networks, for example, because a lot of us and a lot of companies are using you know, the login details from social networks. So it's easy to work with advertising engines from Facebook, Instagram, Google, and all these other platforms. So it's easier to have different formats of communication from now on. So it's in a way easier to personalize the message depending on who is listening and also to kind of create segments of customers based on this. Like again, talking from specialized at this point, you can have a large variety of products and you can have like three, four, five different types of customers. So you can actually just get to all of them at the same time with different campaigns. Besides that, I think not only the e-commerce platforms understood that there was a significant increase on customers after the pandemic, but also the suppliers. So you see a lot of improvements in platforms like Adobe Marketing, for example, Adobe Marketing Cloud. And I don't know, there's plenty of options right now to understand the user journey that our customers are doing. There are plenty of platforms for like ambassadors, for example, like give some commission to ambassadors, influencers, and things like that. You cannot take advantage of and yeah, of course, they are all both taking advantage of these new tools, but also generating information for us to make better decisions on the way. You'd mentioned, obviously, the ability to collect and instrument more rich data. Sometimes data could really send you down a rabbit hole. How are you ensuring that you're parsing a lot of the noise from the signal when analyzing the data that's coming in? Of course, you have to have the right team to do it. And of course, the right abilities to do it not only as a e-commerce user yourself, but also as an e-commerce developer yourself, understanding what is the journey that you have to go through as a user, what is like the best experience for you as a user. So that also gives you like an understanding of what is actually used, yeah, that can be used from what you're gathering. Understanding, you know, KPIs that are quite basic for your performance of your website, such as like conversion rate, user behavior, what else, AOB, for example, there's average order value from your orders, top products, slow movers, fast movers, all these kind of things is usually what you have to review on a daily basis and remove all the churn from there, of course. 
I also think that it's quite funny, but e-commerce managers should be very proficient in digital marketing because there's plenty of numbers that you have to understand on a daily basis. And I don't know, eventually just kind of use what you have in terms of supply inventory, for example, and then convert that information into actionable campaigns and promotions for your customers to take action immediately. Um, what else? On the other hand, not only knowing digital marketing will save you, there are other parts of the business that you have to understand the bigger you get, like understanding how profitability works for an e-commerce. I've said this quite a few times that I think e-commerce is another business. It's like another company. Retail has their own way to work in a way, and e-commerce has another way that works a little bit faster. It's a little bit more urgent all the times. Customers don't want to wait three, four days to get their packages. It's usually as fast as possible. So if you get how profitability works, for example, that also gives you an advantage on how to read information and how to take decisions out of it. And yeah, at the very end, and I think this is the humanistic part of e-commerce, you have to have empathy. You want to have a happy customer at the end of the day, of course. And if you understand what they're going through and what is the use they are giving to your product, what is the benefit they're getting from it, then that also helps you improve areas of your operation that needs to be improved. And one thing you mentioned is understanding and making sure and having empathy for the customer, making sure they're happy. What are some of the ways that you track customers' happiness? And do you have any examples of when you were kind of tracking this, what KPIs you were using, and how you actually look to drive that upwards over time? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of actually improving customer satisfaction all the time. It's a little bit difficult, of course. And when you're growing, when you're getting bigger, it's usually harder to do that as you grow, right? It's not linear. Like if you grow sales, you're not going to increase or maintain customer satisfaction at the same pace. It's usually a little bit more difficult. So um, the first thing, you have to have a CRM. We have one, a CRM, and there are some metrics that we try to review on a daily basis, weekly basis with the teams like CSAT, customer satisfaction scores, like understanding what was their satisfaction from buying, from getting their products, not only like what was their experience shopping online, what was their experience with the delivery, what was their experience with the product itself. And after a couple of months, you can also ask what was the overall experience of using that product. For example, you also got the usual and trustworthy MPS, Net Promoter Score, that also allows you to understand if they are actually, you know, someone that will promote your brand in the future. And that depending on the reasons that you are evaluating, you can take action. You can have an agent call them and understand like what is going on. If there's something that is going on there, or it was just a one-time situation that they went through. But of course, that information goes deep depending on how you use it. Well, yeah, of course, based on MPS, for example, in CSAT, you have cases, cases like contacts from your customers. Like if they need anything, you have to document that. If they are just hesitant because, I don't know, they don't understand the product, then you have to improve your descriptions, perhaps. I don't know. The question that we always get is like, where is my order? So traceability and information about the order is essential, for example. If you don't have the resources to show that, then you have to work on that. And as I mentioned cases a moment ago, like how many cases you have open still, for example, how many days have been they open? How long is your agents taking you to close them all? And if they are taking a while, then we need to understand the reasons. Are you understaffed or is this issue quite frequent? Are there some requests that you can automate or, I don't know, probably use your chatbot to do some of the work for you, profile your customers before they're actually getting to your agents? I don't know. There are a lot of things that you can do to get that better. And now that you mentioned customer satisfaction, there are two that I think are essential for every e-commerce, that is repurchase rate and lifetime value. I don't see a lot of e-commerce platforms using lifetime value as a KPI for satisfaction. Sometimes they use it for sales, like a sales performance indicator, right? But I think it's also a customer satisfaction indicator. Because if you have a big lifetime value from your customers, that means you are doing what you have to do. I mean, you're keeping them happy. They are spending money on you and they are a loyal customer that will promote you in the future. So that a good lifetime value is like a good MPS, like a good CSAT, like a good 
AOB, like a good conversion rate. And of course, as everyone says, like it's cheaper to get your customers to buy back than getting a new customer. So it's quite logical. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And you'd mentioned obviously a lot of areas that you've been able to drive value. When you look at like the market as a whole, is there any areas that you think data is still underutilized? And how do you actually think that companies should look at leveraging that to kind of get an edge on the yeah. competition and just winning the market as a whole? I've met a few entrepreneurs like doing e-commerce. And of course, also from my perspective, working for a big company, I think that most entrepreneurs are like good at the product. They're experts in the product. They know how to sell the product or even manufacture the product in most cases. But I don't see them getting into the, as I said, operational part of the business. How to improve logistics, for example, how to improve customer experience, product strategy, assortment, or even development in a way. That part of the business that I said at the beginning is not like the previous thing of operating an e-commerce. It's also very essential. Like I see most of them just working with what they have. And I understand also they don't have perhaps the enough volume to get special agreements with carriers. But there are ways to improve, for example, the cost of delivering or improving your packaging experience for your customers. That's also a very nice thing in terms of e-commerce. Supply chain and product strategy, I believe, is also essential. It doesn't matter what you sell. In most cases, you see that either they are only D2C, like only e-commerce. In a lot of cases, you also see that there is a mix of them. Like they also sell in retail or sell in e-commerce. And in other cases, they even sell in marketplaces or digital partners, things like that. But it's very important to understand what product goes to each channel. Like what is more optimal for that experience? I've seen a lot of cases where they just put everything in all channels. And then, as I said at the beginning, for example, for Europe, you get a lot of prices for one product. And then you don't ensure like the right experience in retail, e-commerce and marketplaces. It should be consistent and they should work together instead of competing with each other. Yeah, you know, that makes a ton of sense, Luis. It's really, really cool to hear obviously experience in multiple different markets. So it's really, really cool to hear the differences and multi-channel, multi-market. I think it brings a ton of challenges and I think data is at the heart of a lot of those answers. As we look to wrap up and we reflect on today's conversation, can you share with us any forward-looking piece of advice or any key insights for someone who's trying to kind of follow a similar trajectory in their career that you took? Yeah. At the beginning of my career, I was very focused on digital marketing and understanding these numbers and how to drive more revenue, like how to optimize my advertising spend and get more money getting into my e-commerce platforms. But eventually, I understood that I had to get more into the financial part of the business, like understanding how revenue works in general, what drives value to my e-commerce platform, rather than just driving volume, but also driving value. Like if you sell, what is the actual purpose of this product? What is the benefit our customers will get from it? And from that also understanding other key performance indicators that with time lead you to have a more consistent infrastructure for your e-commerce. Like I said, if you have, for example, a very small returns rate, that means that you have good products, that your policies are on point, that you have, I don't know, really good customer service. Um, what else? Repurchase rate, for example, as I said, if you have really good loyalty programs or there are some benefits for buying back, discounts, coupons, things like that, that also will drive consistent growth for your e-commerce platforms. Supply chain and logistics are also an essential part of the business and essential part of the revenue of a business. And sometimes it doesn't matter how much you grow, you have to have the right structure for you to grow sustainably in a way, right? So my advice would be like to get into all these other parts of the business too, like understanding again, supply chain management, logistics management, warehouse management, customer service. Again, not the previous part of e-commerce, but also very, very important. Yeah, I think what you're saying makes sense. I think being able to drive top line sales is one thing, but doing it in a profitable way. At the end of the day, you don't want e-commerce to be a cost center. You want it to be a profit center. So no, I think everything you're saying there is definitely landed. Look, Luis, I learned a lot, especially around kind of connecting the two different markets. And obviously, congratulations in your career so far. And I think it was a very, very valuable episode. So thanks again for your time. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much for having me, Kelly. My pleasure for joining you and sharing what I have. Awesome.
The e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives is brought to you by Noibu. To find out more about Noibu and how we can help you debug your e-commerce site and rocket your revenue, visit www.noibu.com. That's N-O-I-B-U.com. And then make sure to search for the e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Noibu, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.